So we have a special treat today. I want to introduce our special guest speaker today as we continue our Imperfect Hero series. So Pastor Gabe Garcia is the pastor of New City Church in Oakland, a church plant launched in 2021. Current has the privilege to support Gabe and Kari and New City through our church plant grant, and we love hearing all that God is doing in Oakland. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Gabe Garcia. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, great to be with you today. Again, my name is Gabe. I'm a church planting pastor in the city of Oakland. If you don't know what a church plant is, basically a couple years ago, my family and I were crazy enough to move to Oakland in the middle of a pandemic and try to get a new church community uh, started. And we couldn't do it without your guys' support. So I'm here just to say thank you so much for your generosity if you guys are people here that are giving generously to Current Church, just know that your generosity is fueling a gospel movement in the city of Oakland, and we're just so thankful for that. Our church meets at 4 p.m., so as soon as I'm done here, I'll drive home and start thinking about 100 details for our service. Uh, so it really is just a delight to be here with you this morning and to just be and to worship and rest and to enjoy you guys. So thank you guys for having me today. Now you're here today whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm so glad you're here and you've landed at a great church. This is a great church, a great community that will allow you to ask questions, to wrestle with your doubts, and to just have you take one step at a time, hopefully in your spiritual journey with Jesus. But whether you're a Christian or not, each and every one of us in this room, we've gone through seasons of our life where we've asked questions like this. God, if you are there, where are you and what are you doing? After you've been laid off, perhaps, God, where are you and what are you doing? All you've wanted is marriage and to start a family and it just hasn't happened yet. God, where are you and what are you doing? When your kids wake you up at 3.30 in the morning with a bloody nose, God, where the heck are you and what are you doing? There's personal experience there, guys. Today, I want to introduce you to a character in a book in the Bible that causes us as the reader to wrestle with those same questions. I want to introduce you guys to Ruth. Now, on one level, of the book of Ruth is this beautiful love story between unlikely people, Ruth and Boaz. But it also takes time um, in Israel's history. It takes time in a place of great spiritual darkness and even personal tragedy. I think, again, this book causes us to ask that same question, God, where are you and what are you doing? And what we'll see is that while we're legitimately asking those questions, and God can handle those questions, Current, while we're legitimately asking those questions, God is working behind the scenes to accomplish something more beautiful than we could ever imagine. And maybe we need to be reminded of that today, that God is here and God is working. No matter what's going on globally, no matter what's going on locally, no matter what's going on in your life personally, Lord knows, no matter what's going on politically, God is still here and God is working. So again, today I want to introduce you to Ruth and I hope for the believer in the room today to renew your faith in the presence and in the power of God. If you have your Bibles, open up to Ruth chapter 1. If you're here today and you don't have a Bible, uh, don't worry about it at all. Uh, I'm going to provide the text uh, on the screen, I think, yes, behind me. So today we're going to start with Ruth chapter 1. We're going to look at a number of different passages throughout the book of Ruth, but we'll start here in Ruth chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 1 to 5. It says this, In the day when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. 
The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. The names of their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Here's the first heading for our time together. What I want you to see is that Ruth shines in a time of spiritual darkness. Ruth shines in a time of spiritual darkness, and I believe if Ruth can shine in a time of spiritual darkness, so can we. And we look at these first five verses, there is not a lot to grab onto. This isn't the beginning of a feel-good story. We see that this book takes place in the time of the judges. This was a low point in Israel's history. For the people of God, this is after they had entered into the promised land, but this was before the monarchy. So this is before King Saul. This is before King David. This is before King Solomon. And if you actually look at the last verse in the book of Judges, this is how the writer will summarize these days. Judges 21-25 says this, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. This was, again, a low point in Israel's history. Everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. But it's not just a time of spiritual darkness. We also read in the first five verses of Ruth, there's also a famine. And for the people of Israel, oftentimes the two were connected. Israel's spiritual unfaithfulness could be connected to this physical famine. God actually using this famine as a form of judgment and a way to bring the people of God back to himself. But what we read here is instead of this one family, the family of Elimelech and Naomi running to God, what do they do? They run away to another country. They run away to Moab. Moab would be now modern-day Jordan. And at the time that this was written, Uh, The people of Moab are seen as enemies of God. So again, uh, Naomi and Elimelech are experiencing this physical famine. God, where are you and what are you doing? But instead of running towards God, they run away from God. I wonder if you can just think about your own life, if there's anything that's difficult and challenging that's causing you to run away from him. As a pastor, it's so I want to be patient and loving, but it's so frustrating because sometimes as people go through the hardest seasons of life, they feel like they have to remove themselves from the church. It's during these times that we need one another. It's during these times that we actually need God more than ever. But again, Ruth and Naomi, or Naomi and Elimelech, they run away. We also find out that during this time, Elimelech dies, that uh, Naomi's two sons, they marry Moabite women, and then her two sons die. In a day and a culture where having a son to carry on the family name is everything, Naomi is left with nothing. Verse 5 says this, Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Again, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? See, I think this little book right here gives us, the reader, the opportunity to reflect on the realities of living in a world that's filled with pain and suffering. I mean, we are a preventative culture. We want to do everything we can to prevent pain and suffering. We want to do everything we can to prevent discomfort. I already alluded to my three kids. I love my three kids, but they're crazy. And this summer, we went on a road trip. And I don't know if you know or can remember or can think about three kids on a road trip. It can go bad real quick. And as a father, I want to do everything I can to prevent chaos and breakdown in my car on this road trip. So what would I do? 
I prepare, and I want to make sure I can prevent the worst from happening. So we've got snacks, we've got games, we've got entertainment, we've got everything because I want to be prepared and I want to prevent discomfort. Oftentimes, we work so hard to prevent pain, suffering, and discomfort, but no matter how hard we try, suffering is inevitable. And maybe, just maybe, God will also use the hard seasons of our life as an invitation to call us back to himself, as an invitation to draw near. Is there anything in your life right now that's maybe causing you to drift away from God? See the pain, see the challenges, see the difficulties, see the suffering again as an invitation from God to draw close to him. Things are devastating for Naomi. She loses her husband. She loses her two sons. She changes her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, to Mara, which means bitter. And as the story unfolds, her bitterness is really directed at God. But against the backdrop of her bitterness, again, Ruth's character shines forth. Again, remember, Ruth is from Moab, which might not mean much to us, but the Moabites were seen as enemies of God. So for the original readers, it would have almost been shocking to see Ruth shine in the way she does in this little book. Ruth shows herself to be a loyal daughter-in-law to Naomi. Ruth models kindness. Ruth models generosity. Ruth models faithfulness. But most importantly, what we see in Ruth is somebody who runs to God in the midst of suffering. Eventually, Naomi and Ruth and Orpah will get word that this famine has ended back in Bethlehem. And Naomi will set her her eyes on heading back home after after 10 years. She encourages her daughter-in-laws to go back. And on many levels, that's kind of the practical move. And one of her daughter-in-laws, Orpah, does just that. But listen to how Ruth replies. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, she says this, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Again, we see the love of Ruth. We see the loyalty of Ruth. But I think this love and loyalty goes beyond Naomi. I think somewhere along in Ruth's journey, even as a Moabite, even as an outsider, even as an other, God has revealed himself to Ruth in such a profound way that when she says, I want to stay with you, she is clinging on to Naomi as a way to cling on to the God of Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Where you lay, I will lay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Again, we have in Naomi and Ruth two different responses to pain and suffering. And it gives us the opportunity to think through how we would respond. Suffering is inevitable, and we can run away like Naomi, or we can run to God like Ruth. And so I guess my question, even just for us today, as we look at Ruth cling to God, what does it look like for you to take a step closer to him? What does it look like for you today to cling on to God, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what you're going through, What does it look like for you to cling on to God? In the days when everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes, Ruth shines forth. Here's my next heading today, uh, current church. Number two is this. Even in times of darkness, God never stops working. Even in times of darkness, God never stops working. See, the days of Ruth and Naomi are the same days that we're living in. 
even if we think about our own city or region, like the Bay Area isn't thriving with people that are hungering after honoring God. I don't know how many times my car has to get broken into in Oakland, right? We see more and more people forced on the streets. We see abuses of authority fill our headlines every single day. And again, we look around and we can ask this question, God, where are you? And God, what are you doing? But I think if we pay attention to the book of Ruth, we pay attention to our own lives, what we see is even in the midst of the darkness, God is still here and God is still working. This summer, I had the privilege and opportunity to go to Kenya with my 13-year-old son. We partnered with this organization that is focusing on one tribe, the Pokot tribe, to bring clean water and the good news of the gospel to these people. We had this amazing opportunity to actually visit one village that doesn't have a clean water well, and we walked with these women down to the riverbed, and we started digging in the riverbed, and we started collecting all the dirty water that was rising to the surface. We filled these yellow buckets with dirty water. We carried these yellow buckets back to their village. I thought I would be able to carry two buckets. Very quickly, I realized I could only carry one. It was the hardest, most exhausting thing that I've ever done. And then we saw these women use this water to drink from, to feed their children, to cook with, to feed the animals with. It was heartbreaking. I mean, from the outside, it was so easy to ask this question, God, where are you and what are you doing here? But we also saw these people, and it's probably not surprising to you at all, they were filled with so much joy. We actually came back from this water walk And it was like this impromptu worship service just broke out. There was no stage. There was no lights. There was no screen. There was just nothing. There was nothing, and yet it seemed like they had everything. Even in the midst of the hardness and the harsh realities of this world, God is still working. And the story behind the story in the book of Ruth is that God will provide for Ruth and Naomi through this one man named Boaz. Again, remember, Ruth and Naomi, they make their way back to Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem means house of bread. So again, the start of this book, there is no bread in the house of bread. But after 10 years, they hear that this famine is over, and now they journey back with very little. I would imagine nothing to their name. No husbands, no sons, nothing. Perhaps they come back, especially Naomi, with guilt and shame. Again, God, where are you and what are you doing? God is going to provide for Naomi and Ruth again through this man named Boaz. And if Ruth shines, Boaz is his counterpart. Let's look at the text, Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. If you study the book of Ruth, uh, this relative, or Boaz being a relative, is really significant. A man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Again, think about how Ruth is shining. She's come back with her mother-in-law, and now she's like, I'm just going to go to the fields to provide for you and me. Again, what an amazing character. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, the Lord be with you. They responded, the Lord blessed you. I I love how the text says, as it turned out, and just then. It almost feels like this is random, or it's happened by chance. But what we see in the book of Ruth is God is the one who is behind every plot movement in this story. And I want you to hear that today that God is behind every plot movement in your story. And as we're introduced to Boaz and this love story unfolds between Boaz and Ruth, we see Boaz is a worthy character to learn from. 
Boaz is a man of integrity. Boaz is a man of wisdom. Boaz is a provider. Boaz is a protector. I think there's a lot of confusion about what it means to be a man today. And I'm not saying we all need to be Boaz and have a field and become harvesters. But I think there is something in Boaz's character that is worth us learning from. Now, again, this love story isn't like the latest rom-com on Netflix where two people meet on a train and it's all chalked up to kind of chance and alignment of the stars. No, God is the one that brings Ruth and Naomi home. God is the one who leads Ruth to this particular field. Out of all the fields she could have gone to, she goes to Boaz's field. God is the one who is there in the midst of our confusion, pain, and suffering. He is always there working in surprising and beautiful ways. Theologians call this the providence of God, where God is governing all things according to his perfect plan and perfect will. Now, the point of the book of Ruth is not that every woman needs a man to provide for them. Amen? The point of Ruth is that every man and woman needs a God that they can trust is working for their good. I don't know what God is doing in your life. I don't know what he's doing as you go through pain and suffering, as you lose a job, as you end a a significant relationship, as your kids wake you up at 3.30 in the morning. I don't know what God is doing, but I know he is there And I know he is doing something. I'm not saying we have to understand God all the time, but I want us to be a people that see he is worth trusting. Even when we don't have the answers, and we so want the answers, and we so want control, and we so want things to be easy and comfortable. But when all of that is thrown out the window, there is still a God who is good and that we can trust him. The book of Ruth reminds us that even in times of uncertainty, God is always working. Our responsibility is try to align ourselves with God's will, his plans for our lives. So what does it look like for you today? If you really believe God is here, if you really believe that God is working, what does it look like for you to align yourself so that we can best, we can best kind of catch the wave of what God is doing. Maybe that means you need to remove some things from your life. Maybe that means you need to add some things to your life. What does it look like for you to best align yourself with how he is working? He is here and he is working. Let's look at chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Again, we're skipping over so much, and I hope in part this little introduction to the character of Ruth and the book of Ruth encourages you to maybe spend a little time this summer just diving into this book. Chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. So Boaz and Ruth, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Again, we skipped over a lot, but they get married. Woohoo! Uh, when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. The woman, that's like the women of the town. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here's my next heading today. God is faithful to bring good gifts. God is faithful to bring you and I good gifts. Boaz is a gift to Ruth. Ruth is a gift to Boaz. And here we see there's a son that's a gift to Boaz, Ruth, and even Naomi. I love how the text says, the Lord enabled her to conceive. Remember at the end of chapter 1? At the end of chapter 1, or even the first five verses, 
There's no bread in the house of Bethlehem, and Naomi is left with no sons. At the end of this whole book, there's a harvest in Bethlehem. There's now bread in the house of bread. And Ruth and Boaz have this son. Naomi now has this, this grandson, a boy named Obed, Obed who fathered Jesse, and Jesse who fathered David. In the days of the judges where everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes when there was no king. Remember, this is a time of great spiritual decay. But the book of Ruth ends with the great-grandfather of David. David who becomes the king of Israel. David who has a heart that is running after the Lord. I want to bring you to 2 Samuel 7 because there's a promise that God gives to David there. In 2 Samuel 7 This is what the Lord says to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Your own flesh and blood, I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What is God saying? Uh, through you, David, there will, be a, there will be somebody who sits on the throne of a forever kingdom. Through you, David, will come an even greater gift. Now, we're reading the Bible, and we're trying to figure out who this is. Who is this king that will sit on the forever throne? Is it King Saul? No. Is it King David? No. Is it King Solomon? No. I want to encourage you to go home and read the the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Aren't those genealogies so easy to skip over? But as we read that genealogy, the most unlikely person pops up, an outsider, an other, an enemy of God, a woman, a widow, Ruth, Ruth who is the father of Obed, who fathers Jesse, who fathers King David, and generations later would come King Jesus. God is always working in surprising and beautiful ways. God is always working for our good to bring us, to bring us great gifts. What are the gifts that God is giving you today? I think sometimes We have tunnel vision on the things we don't have that we miss out on all the good things we do have. And I know your story might be different than my story, and you might experience um, pain and suffering in this particular moment. But I think for all of us, God has graciously and generously given us good gifts that we, we don't actually deserve. And I want to remind us that all the good gifts that God has given us, maybe it's marriage, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a job, maybe it's a moment of rest. All these good gifts that God gives us point us to the true gift. Obed was a gift, but Obed wasn't the true gift. Obed would father Jesse, would father David, and generations later, the true gift would come, the true gift is King Jesus. What are the good gifts that God has given you in this season of your life? Are you enjoying those gifts? Are you learning from those gifts? Are you acknowledging that those good gifts come from a generous and gracious gift giver? And are you seeing how those good gifts point to the true king, King Jesus? And if Jesus is the true king, I wonder what it might look like for us to continue to make Jesus the king of every single area of our lives. You guys are in this series, uh, Imperfect Heroes. I love that title because there are some great heroes throughout the Bible, um, but all of them are just that. They're, They're imperfect. And as the band comes up, I just want to remind us that as we look at this story, Ruth isn't the real hero. Boaz isn't the real hero. Obed isn't the hero. Jesse isn't the hero. David isn't the hero. The real hero is Jesus. 
And what makes Ruth's life significant, what makes Boaz's life significant, is that these two people point us to the true hero. So I don't know what God is doing in your life in this particular season. Maybe you're here today and you've come in asking those particular questions. God, where are you? God, what are you doing? I'm not sure where he is. I'm not sure what he's doing in your life. But I know he's here and I know he's doing something. And no matter where you're at in your journey, you can live a life of significance today. Not by becoming the hero of your story, but by pointing others to the true hero. You can live a life of significance today by pointing others to King Jesus. Current church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for this faith community here in the Bay Area. I pray a blessing over this congregation. I pray more than anything, we would see you as a good God who gives good gifts in that Jesus is the greatest of gifts. I pray that we might, in a small way or a big way, enjoy that gift a little bit more in this moment, a little bit more tomorrow, a little bit more the next day, that the rest of our days would be spent enjoying the gift of Jesus. We actually thank you that we're not the heroes of the story. That's too much pressure and causes too much anxiety. But we thank you that you've allowed us to be here in this moment and that we can live lives of significance, even in pain and suffering, as we point people to the true hero of the stories. We point people to King Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.